Hello and welcome to a new a new webinar uh, Festo. Uh, today we'll have a very interesting topic. My colleague from Poland, uh, Zbislav Vita, will present uh, energy efficiency in pneumatic systems. It will be uh, in two sessions because the topic is very large and very important in uh, uh, factory automation uh, and he will uh, be your host for uh, for today and uh, next week's session uh, at the end of the presentation we will have a q a session so please use the chat to ask your questions there and at the end we will have uh, my colleague um responding to your uh, to your question so v you have the you have the screen and the mic thank you so much for the introduction uh as alexandru uh, introduced me my name is bisopit i'm an energy efficiency auditor for festo for a few years now um i work from poland but uh, really the scope of my work is uh, all around the world so um, I actually have uh, quite uh, quite a lot of um, global and uh, various ex experience. Um, and yes, the topic of energy efficiency is very close, not only to my work but also to my heart. So I'm very happy to uh, to tell you all about it. As Alexander was uh, was saying. Um, the presentation is going to be divided in two. Uh, on today's sessions, we will focus mainly about uh, uh, um, generation, preparation, and air quality. And then uh, knowing all the basics, all the very important physics, uh, we will talk about savings mostly. So uh, about the optimization of the applications, um, very big savings that are possible uh, on blowing applications and vacuum applications also incredible amount of savings that, that we can save on leakage detection and we will summarize the whole uh, the whole webinar and the informations that are coming from it i will not bore you with all of the numbers but on this slide there are two informations that are very important also for me uh, Festo in reinvests 8% of its revenue to R&D. So that means that we can develop new products, new tools, new services to better solve our clients' needs and also make our work easier and better. We have 61 companies worldwide. So as I told you before, we have experiences from all over the world. So especially in energy efficiency, the knowledge that we are using comes from very different countries, different climates, uh, various working environments, and gets tested in uh, various conditions. Yes, so when, wherever we, uh, we are, uh, we, we gather all the information and improve it. To, to work all over the world. About the compressed air, not all people know now that it's one of the most expensive energy carriers that is used in the industry. Air is air, yes, so this is all around us, so why compressed air should be expensive? But in fact it is, uh, we are not using uncompressed air from the atmosphere, we have to compress it and it takes a lot of energy to do so. Uh, it takes so such a big amount of energy that the cost of generating is uh, and generating it ranges from 10 to 30 percent of plants' total costs of operation. So this is a huge amount of money that goes into uh, compressing air. And not to be obvious, but generation of course requires electricity and electricity emits greenhouse gases. So this is once again very important subject not only for us uh, but also environmental, political. Uh, there are 
more and more pressures to uh, to produce uh, less greenhouse gases so once again another level on which the subject is very important and yeah savings in compressed air can reduce the electricity consumption and of course then reduce the greenhouse gas emissions when it comes to greenhouse gas emission in Romania, the situation is actually very, very good. Uh, for, of course, like for sure, it's much better in Poland. We, we sadly use quite a lot of uh, coal in our um, electricity production, which is, I'm very happy that it's not the situation in, uh, in Romania. Uh, in 2021, the average emissions uh, that Rom uh, Romania was Everything was on the level of 273 grams of CO2, CO2 equivalent per one kilowatt hour. And this is actually a very good result. So I was very happy to see that most of the energy uh, was produced from renewable so sources. Uh, major source of energy is hydrovoltaic uh, systems and the coal usage was no bigger than 18% in 2021. But yesterday I've checked what was the actual values for yesterday, for, for one day, and the results are even, even better. The trend is get going better. The CO2 equivalent is going down. Coal uh, was being used at 2% fantastic and 59 percent of renewable energy uh, to produce energy in romania yesterday amazing so i'm very happy to to see that uh, that uh, the the whole society the whole country is uh, going in a very good direction but we have to remember that clean energy is not really 100 percent clean because we refer to it as carbon free but it's not emitting uh, co2 during the operation but it's not really 100 percent car carbon free we produce carbon dioxide all over the life cycle of the of the system so whether we are mining the subtracts we are mm, using it uh, for construction maintenance or we have to dispose of course of the uh, of the waste especially dangerous when you are talking about nuclear nuclear energy but also uh, quite dangerous when you are talking about photovoltaics so we have to think not only about the carbon emissions but the whole carbon footprint of the uh, of the product the cost of electricity uh, in here we have data from 2019 so during the last years and during the last months uh, a lot of uh, has changed but a few years ago uh, Romania uh, and Poland and Hungary actually had a very very similar cost of electricity around 10 cents per one kilowatt hour uh, so actually we actually we are in the middle of the um, of european uh, countries and this is not really a bad level to be on so now to talk about factors affecting the compressed air generation and of course the first factor is going to be cost but the cost of energy is not the only cost that we have to think about when you are producing compressed air it's going to be a big part of it and usually it's around 75 percent but we have to keep in mind that it's not the only thing that we have that is important so we have the variable costs that go into the cost of compressed air which is electricity consumption but then to add to it there is oil and uh, filter consumption and repairs and maintenance of our machines, of course. To that, we have to add fixed cost, which is amortization of funds invested in the system, and the costs that are area related. So usually we have to ventilate the compressor room. 
sometimes in hot climates we have to use air conditioning to to put the uh, temperature down and this is only the um, Mm, uh, denominator of the mm, uh, of the equation but we have to think about how many air are we producing while using the electricity yes so we have to we have to divide the costs by the actual air consumption of the compressor and then only then we have an actual actual cost of compressed air the average cost of compressed air uh, in our region is around two cents uh, for normal cubic meter. Uh, it's, uh, the unit looks kind of funny. Uh, it's not a newtonometer uh, to the third power. It's normal cubic meter. Uh, so it's like one meter, one cubic meter of air that is uncompressed normally in the atmosphere. So it's one bar and 20 degrees uh, Celsius. Then we, uh, if we compress it, yes, so uh, let's say one meter of uh, air compressed to seven bars is going to cost us seven times as much. So when we are compressing uh, the air, we can save some of the money that we are putting into the uh, machines, but by heat recovery. When we are using very old systems, the cost of compressed air can go even up to 10 cents for uh, normal cubic meter. And this is mostly going into heat production. In the old systems, as much as 94% was wasted on um, on heat generation, only six percent of the energy was used to uh, efficiently. So we are making more e efficient compressors. We are using them uh, better, but they are still produce quite a lot of uh, heat. And that heat we can take from the compressors and use in our systems. The task is not the easy one because we have to have a possibility of using the heat quite close to the compressor room. So we can use it for uh, heating the um, area. We can use it for heating the water. Uh, or uh, if, uh, if we don't need the heat, it's very important for us to take the heat from the compressors and just throw it away, uh, ventilate the room as much as possible because we want to keep the compressors cool. But we'll talk about this in a minute. While designing a compressor room, uh, what we want to achieve is the base of the um, compressed air usage. We want to use fixed speed compressors. So load and load compressors uh, that are uh, working on and off the top of the usage we want to achieve using variable speed compressors and this is um, one of the points that comes back to this slide if we are using our uh, fixed speed compressors as much as possible we are producing as much air as possible then the air is cheap because the compressor is working efficiently and with the energy that we put into it, we, uh, we take as much air as it's, as it's completely possible. So the price goes down. When we are talking about variable speed compressors, usually the uh, most efficient range is around 30 to 70%. So uh, we want to use it not in the max of its capability. So if uh, once again, if we are talking about the uh, usage in the in the in the factory the the base of the chart we want to fill with using the fixed speed compressors and then the top we want to uh, fill with variable speed compressors and this would be a system that 
are that is let's say by the book yes so we have two smaller compressors working at full capa uh, capacity and those are fixed speed compressors one trim compressor as as we call it and this is a bigger variable speed compressors and it's bigger just to work in the most efficient zone yes so it has to be calculated for for the system then they are producing air into a wet receiver then the wet air is going to be dried and the dry air we put into a dry receiver then it would be absolutely best to have some uh, pressure and uh, flow control or meters and then we go into the production zone so this is like the by the booked perfect solution mm, in here if we would have if we uh, wouldn't uh, wouldn't have the the dry receiver then the bottleneck of the system is the dryer we can produce from the system only as much air as the dry dryer can uh, dry at the same time the other way if we don't have the wet receiver uh, once again uh, we mm, are <coughs> uh, we are making the the dryer work uh, work hard So, while selecting the compressor, we have to think about few few subjects. So, the first, the absolute most important one, is to select the uh, parameters for the real needs of the plant. Because, as I told you before, we want to use the compressors in their most effective zones. So, all the power that we are wasting is just money being burned into heat that we absolutely don't don't need so we have to think about the capacity of the compressor the pressure levels that we are using and the air quality that we uh, that we need then we have to think if we are using fixed or variable speed compressors yes which uh, which one do we actually need we uh, in the in the systems we usually want to have only one variable speed compressor. So most of the work is going to be done by the fixed speed compressor, and then the top is going to be fulled, fulfilled by the, by the variable speed compressor. So it's going to be the most adaptable that is, uh, that is possible. So uh, if we have more than two compressors, we would like to have an over, overhead control that is going to steer the um, compressors once again in the most effective uh, effective way it's very hard to achieve proper cooperation of the compressors if we just do it by manual settings if we have the possibility of heat recovery and energy recovery from the compressors uh, it's absolutely fantastic to use it it's quite hard to do and it's a little bit expensive but once again if we if we can do it uh, it's very important to uh, to to consider and to to think about well uh, not only um, um, buying new systems but also uh, if we are uh, uh, if we um, are re remodeling our our own uh, compressor rooms and also very 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 important point is to provide a reserve in case of emergency because that's where the real money can be wasted if we have to hold our production because our compressors are uh, our compressors don't work this is a catastrophe so the most the more we use our compressors the cheaper air we have but then again, we have to remember that we have to have so-called redundancy in the system. So we have to be ready for any of the machines to break. So uh, we, we have to make a calculation that if we're going to have <clears throat> an emergency, if we're going to have um, a failure on, on 
any of the compressors or dryers that we are still going to have enough dry and pressurized air for our um, plant to, to operate and function properly. Another thing to consider uh, talking about the compressor room is not only the equipment that we put in, but also the compressor room itself. It has to be clean, dust free, dry and cool. So usually we want to uh, put the air intake on the north side of the uh, of the compressor room. Uh, we want it to be clean. We don't want to uh, make it into a storage room because also the flow of the air inside of the room is uh, is quite important for the energy efficiency of the uh, of the machines. So uh, it's very important to uh, to also look around the machines uh, and to provide them with the best conditions to to work uh, so adequate ventilation in the, in the compressor room is also very important and th this goes straight into the money so usually the reduction of temperature by three degrees celsius gives us one percent ele less electricity that the um, um, compressors need to use so if we go into our compressor room, we actually feel that it's almost a sauna. And there are rooms like this uh, that, are, that I've been in. Then we have to think, we have to invest into ve uh, ventilation uh, and maybe sometimes even, as I was talking before, air conditioning of the compressor room to provide the best possible conditions for our machines to operate. So. Another thing to consider is to ensure installation capacity. So in here we have wet tanks, dry tanks, and the piping, because the pipes are really uh, small tanks that we have all around, the, all around our installation. This is actually sometimes even bigger volume of air that we have in, uh, uh, in our in our tanks. By, by the rule of thumb, you want to have one cubic meter of tanks for 10 kilowatts of used fixed uh, compressor power. If we have a, a 100 kilowatt um, fixed speed compressor that is working 100% all the time, so we want to have at least 10 cubic meters of installation capacity for the pressure to be on the proper level for uh, to to operate and very 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 important we have to think about content condensate drains and separators um, on every point of the compressor um, uh, machines we have a drain of the condensate so if we try if we pressurize the air the condensate the the water is going out of it if we put it in a wet, wet tank there is also going to be water uh, flowing down on the tank and we have to take take it from there of course in the dryers it's their main job to uh, to do to push the water out of the air and uh, of course on the filtrations, uh, filtration devices also. So we have to collect all of the condensate and we cannot put it into the uh, drain. We have to separate it because the, uh, the emulsion is going to be not only clean water, but also oil. And with the oil, we have to uh, throw it out in the proper uh, in a proper way. So it's once again very important to use the condensate separators to separate the water from the oil and do not throw the oil into uh, into the normal uh, uh, water drain. The power consumption of the compressors is 
of course, lower if the pressure that they are providing is lower. And for one bar of pressure, it's usually around 7% of energy. It's very important to, uh, to uh, mm, remember it because we're going to come back to it uh, many, many times during, uh, during the presentation. And especially during this subject, which is uh, distribution networks and uh, how does it um, affect the system pressure? So why the reduction of pressure drops in the network is so important? Whenever we change anything about the direction, diameter, length of uh, of the piping in which the air is flowing, we are losing um, kinetic energy, we are losing money because we have to generate more pressure, more force to go through the installation. So excessive piping lengths, insufficient diameters, changes of direction, uh, reductions, uh, of uh, the diameter. Any fittings or connections also uh, make our flow lower and our worst enemy leakages that are just wasting the air that we are putting into the system. All of it creates a pressure drop in the installation. So if we have a system in which all of the machines, as, as you can uh, see here, have no problems with pressure drops and we have high pressure on them and we have one machine that is making all of the problems so the connection is bad the machine is very far from the compressor room the piping is small the piping is very long um, and the pressure drop is high in in, um, in this example is as much as 1.1, 1.2 bar from the from the system uh, pressure. That means that we have to keep the pressure level in the whole plant way too high just for this one machine to operate properly. If we would um, eliminate, uh, eliminate the pressure drop for this one machine, what we can do is just drop the whole system pressure down and this is clear saving it's uh, whenever we drop the pressure level in the system we just uh, get the money um, easily uh, we don't have to put it uh, in in the compressor room we don't have to generate too much pressure to to uh, power our system so how to counteract it? We have to keep our eyes open and actually look for the bottlenecks. We have to look for the problems that we are usually quite used to. We, we see them every day. Uh, and as my colleague is, uh, is, is saying, temporary fixes that work usually become permanent. Yes, so if it works, why touch it? And it's not the proper way of um of making the machines efficient yeah we have to, we have to think what uh, uh, about uh, what we are doing so if we are using unnecessary couplings if we are using unnecessary um, piping then we have to be ready that it's creating uh, pressure drops that it's just wasting the money in the in the system <laughs> So whenever we are using too long piping, the problem is not really that serious because uh, the pressure drop is proportional to the uh, to the length. But the biggest problem comes if you are using not a pipe that is not uh, big enough, the diameter is too small, because the pressure drop is uh, inversely proportional to the diameter to the fifth power. So 
if we are using a very small piping, the pressure drop is um, growing in a very, very fast pace. Um, we can see on the left picture that uh, um, I'm sure that whenever we, we go to whichever plant we wouldn't go, there are places that there were new machines that were put in, there were already some pipes uh, that, that we could follow, that it's going to be easy to put uh, a new uh, um, pressure pipe near them. So it's, it's usually made like, like this. It looks nice, yes, it's uh, very cheap to do, but then we have to remember, if we have to keep the pressure higher in the whole system for this machine to work, it is much cheaper to invest in proper piping going from the uh, from the main uh, main system with the proper diameter and with the shortest possible length than to to, to do it um, in the easiest way possible. And about the photo in the right, I don't have to tell you even what's wrong about the photo. Everyone just feels it. Yes. So, but. Once again, it's not that hard to find places that are forgotten about, that are like this since 20, 30 years ago. No one is really uh, looking in this direction and this is how it always was. So that's, that shouldn't how it's going, uh, going to be. Another point uh, that is creating a pressure drop and problems in the in the system are those open networks those fingers that go inside of the network and just end blindly at the furthest point of the um, of the installation so if we have problems um, with installations like this it's usually um, on every level we have problems with not enough pressure we have problems with uh, flow drops and of course we have problems with air quality because we never whenever we have water in the system the water is going to be pushed to the furthest way uh, furthest and lowest point in the installation if it's not going to have any place to go it's going to go to the machines so uh, we're going to talk about uh, air quality in a, uh, in a second, but I don't have to tell you that having water in your pneumatic system and in your very um, expensive and technologically advanced um, machines, it's not a good way to work. So. If we connect the system in rings, so if we close the, uh, the open-ended connections, not only we have better uh, distribution of air in the system, but the system is, mm, has a tendency, as we call, to self-dry. There are no place, places where the water can just flow into. It has to be equalized all around the all around the system so even if we if we have moments when uh, there there is some water in the in the system then after minutes or hours when we have the drier air coming into the, into, into the system it's the system is going to self dry so once again it's a very 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 small investment to connect the, the piping like this, having incredible results when it's, uh, when it's coming to the possibility of reducing the pressure, of making the air quality uh, better, and to have the better network stability. Because as I was talking before, if we have more piping, we have more volume in the system. If we have more volume in the system, then the pipes are working like we would have tanks inside of the production zone so few meters of uh, of a pipe is usually 
as big as um, as a reservoir that we can put inside of uh, inside of um, um, working area in the in the plant, and we don't have to um, put any cages around it. It's not um, as dangerous to have uh, as the tanks. We don't have to service um, the, the installation as much as, as the tanks. So once again, very cheap solution that will uh, make our networks very, very um, good. Another thing to consider are the machine couplings that are very popular. People love to use it. They are super elastic. Uh, we can just move the machines, we can plug in tools, uh, so everyone uh, knows how they work, how, uh, so they are super popular, everyone is using them. But we have to remember that for our ease of use, there are quite a lot of um, moving parts inside, and the Mm, connection itself can be quite big and the thread can be quite big and the pipe after it can be quite big but the flow is not using the connections um, even uh, in the mm, biggest sizes of uh, of uh, half of an inch we have the maximum flow of 1700 liters and this is not a lot and the biggest problem that we can create while using the uh, quick connect uh, connectors is to find that, okay, my machine uses 1,500 liters on average. So if we have a quick connector that has 1,700 liters, then okay, I'm safe. But we have to remember, this is maximum and the machines Usually, uh, when we uh, when we see in the instruction, it's an average, yes. So we have to compare two maximums with each other. So if the machine is using one thousand five hundred on average, but uh, two thousand five hundred max airflow, then whenever the machine is going to want more air, the pressure is going to drop. So, what are the people in the production go, uh, zone going to do, they're going to go to the compressor room and raise the pressure for the machine to work. Because uh, we just put a bottleneck, we just put um, another pre uh, um, pressure drop source in, in our system. We have to remember uh, about this. Once again, uh, to uh, to to show you the um, uh, the actual fo photos from uh, from actual installations, uh, whenever we have branching, whenever we are using a pipe that should go straight to the machine, but it's convenient for us to plug in few machines to the same uh, to the same lines, we are not using enough of a diameter of the pipe for the flow of one machine. It's once again creating big uh, pressure drops. So we have to be wary that, like in the, the photo on the, on the left side, if you are coming in, in a, with a half inch pipe, uh, and then we reduce it into an eight millimeter um, conduit, that inside uh, is, uh, in fact, the hole is six millimeters, then um, if we are going to use a lot of air, the, uh, the piping is not, going to be, is not going to be enough. That's exactly the same situation uh, in the compressor room with the pipes going out of the compressors. If you are going out of the compressor with a three inch pipe, and immediately we are, uh, reducing the, the size to a two inch, then that, that is a clear view that we are choking our compressor, that it wants to use bigger volume of, uh, of the piping after it. So we have to uh, create, once again, I'm sorry for repeating myself, but we have to create the most optimal 
conditions for our machines to work. A very simple um, um, thing that uh, maybe is uh, is very obvious, uh, but we we see it time and time again when we have uh, connections that are um, or working that are not uh, uh, under pressure all the time. So in in here, when we have two connect connectors like this. Uh, we are probably going to uh, create uh, a leakage. So the, um, the piping should not be under any force, should not be under um, any pressure that could dam damage the ceiling or, uh, or work uh, work inappropriately. Uh, also, when we are um, tying down the, uh, the piping to the machine, we cannot squeeze too hard yes? so because then once again we can create uh we can choke the uh the, the piping we can create another pressure drop so so in here in here we have to be uh quite um, wary and safe so Usually, when there are the very big problems in the connection for the for the machine, we can see the manometer just screaming to us and waving the it, it, its hand to us. So while using the old type of the of connector connectors, very old type, uh, inside of it uh, we we have um, a, a pipe that has holes in it. Uh, so there is. A lot of turbulence, the flow is not big enough. And here we can see that the manometer is, is waving with, it, with its hand and just trying to wave at us and say, help, help. The, the connection is not, not good enough. Uh, just by switching the connector to a new type, uh, uh, the pressure is completely stable. Uh, maybe okay. It's uh, the needle is moving just a little bit, but uh, but uh, mm, the uh, mach machine is working much better. On the on the left side with the uh, old connectors, uh, we had uh, we had almost one bar of pressure drop. On the right side, we have like 0.3. Uh, so very cheap solution, but we have to be, um, we have to see it. Yes, we, ha we have to actually feel the subject. It's, um, it's physics that are, uh, when, when, you, when you know it, when you see it, it's very easy to, to go back to your uh, plant and, and to actually uh, repair something just, uh, just by yourself, because it's, uh, when, when you see it once, you're going, we, you're going to remember it. So uh, when you go back to your work, just uh, try, try, try to make it by yourself. You're, I'm sure you're going to find some, uh, some, some solutions that you can immediately just uh, um, start and start the, um, the savings on energy, energy efficiency. And that's uh, exactly the, the situation that we look, look for all of the time. Uh, during our energy uh, energy efficiency audits, and in here we can see with the blue line we have the machine pressure, with the uh, red line we have the machine flow. So whenever the machine is just uh, asking for uh, for more flow, the pressure is going down, and uh, in uh, in here it's going down as low as almost one. Uh, one bar, and this is usually uh, just created only because of the uh, connection is too small or the piping is too long. If we go with the pressure down in the whole system, there are points that may be, will be the examples that need more than any other machine but then again we have solutions to uh, to remedy it 
Yes, so uh, we can use uh, pressure boosters. And of course, pressure booster is not the um, most effective um, th um, equipment to use, but it's um, it makes sense to calculate if you will uh, save more money, and usually you will if there are not many applications that use very high pressure to drop the pressure in the whole installation and to power the the high pressure um, high pressure applications with the pressure booster so uh, so once again to to summarize uh, look for places where the air uh, is losing its kinetic energy when it's changing direction when we are putting it uh, somewhere when it doesn't want to go or doesn't want to be and in here we have we have the uh, exactly the the photo on the left side uh, from the <coughs> from the compressor room uh, the uh, the compressor pipe uh, is um, Putting the pressure, uh, the pressure, the air, compressed air out uh, with a pipe of around one inch, and in here we have a reduction, or maybe even two reductions. Yes, so it's three quarters and down to uh, half of an inch, and then with a half half inch pipe it goes into into the system. So uh, immediately we are losing a lot of energy that we could use otherwise. The last subject I would like to uh, go through is compressed air quality, which is super important uh, because it affects all of the systems inside of the uh, inside of the plant. And we are when we are talking about um, compressed air preparation and quality, uh, we ha have to keep in mind particle content, water content, oil oil content but also oil type that we have in our installation and of course proper pressure and flow because that's another um, thing without which we we cannot properly operate why is it so important if we have uh, water in the installation especially in the iron installations a little bit older ones um, that is creating a lot of rust so if we have rust in the installation we can uh, not only in the extreme situations just damage the pipe but the rust is creating very small particles that are going all around our system where do they go to they go there where already there is a small leakage and on every pneumatic connection even the best one there is a microscopic leakage they are not perfectly sealed so all of the sharp little particles are going to our ceilings they are moving with the machine and acting like knives cutting through all of the seals that we have in our system so we have a situation uh, with a customer that um, had a broken dryer for a few days before they could actually do anything about it and they couldn't stop the production. So they completely flooded the, the installation. And at the beginning, uh, the damage wasn't too hard. So they exchanged some of the um, electric components and they were working as, as normally. Yeah, so nothing happened. But one year later, all of the ceilings in the production zones were damaged. And uh, out of 170,000 uh, zwote, they were wasting more than 100,000 uh, just on leakages. So it's uh, the, the leakage level in the whole production zones was almost 80 percent so it's super important to never let the water go into the installation 
once again, if we have a uh, very um, quality fragile product, for example, food, uh, if we have a paint shop, uh, if you are working on a pharmacological products, if we put uh, water in the installation, after time, uh, we, uh, we can put the water out of the installation. But if we put oil in the installation, then uh, that's done. Uh, it's virtually impossible to take the oil out. So talking about air preparation and air quality, we have to talk about prevention. We have to be ready to prevent the problems before they happen. So once again, super important to calculate the uh, work of your dryers, to think what will happen if the dryer fails. Yes, we'll come to, uh, come to back uh, come back to it in uh, in a second. So talking about the all uh, air quality, usually for typical work with uh, pneumatic components, we want to have class seven four four. Yes, class class seven in particles, four in uh, water content and four in oil content. Uh, just uh, for a normal work with uh, with normal um, components. The lower the class, the better the air quality. Yes, so uh, for example, in uh, pharmacology, uh, we need class one, two, one. Yeah? One in particles, two in uh, dew point and one in uh, oil content. So. Uh, it's in here, the lower the number, the, the better uh, air, air class we, uh, we need to have. And to achieve the proper uh, air quality in the system, our last point where we can uh, save ourselves are the air preparation units. So we, we start from the air preparation from, uh, for example, oil-free compressors, and then we use uh, good dryers, and then we good, uh, use good filtration in the um, compressor room. But then uh, we, have, we have the last line of defense of the air preparation units. And how many filters are we using? We are using as much as necessary and as little as possible. So in here we have a little monster uh, that, uh, that is a very big air preparation unit, but it shows us that it's possible to use, um, you, you, that you don't have to filter if uh, all of the um, air in the whole system, um, you don't have to uh, filter it and uh, make the quality as good as the best um, or the most um, the application that is using the cleanest air, uh, but you can filter just some some of the air for the um, hardest application, and you can use less filtered air in the whole system. And that's once again is uh, is a better solution because on every filtration unit we have once again pressure that that we have that we have to um, that we have to power that we have to supply with higher pressure than uh, than we we actually need whenever we have the preparation units on the machines it's mm, very beneficial to have sensors on them so that we can see what's happening inside if we have information about the pressure we know we can compare with other machines we can compare with similar machines because maybe we have few um, instances of the same of the same machine, and one is working on higher pressure than the other ones. And then we actually know to to come in and to see what's going on. Maybe to to order a service. Maybe to uh, make a reclamation because the the machine is not working properly. It's a clear sign that we can do something about it. Uh, once again, super important to have the flow measurement. So if you are, our leakages are going high, if our um, 
uh, blowing applications are not working correctly and we have flow out of the ordinary, we know we can uh, we can uh, act immediately. Yes. So whenever we can measure something, we can improve it. Without the measurement, we uh, we don't really know. Yeah. So we don't we can we don't have any possibility of of looking inside of the machine and asking it if it is if it is working uh, correctly. So to dry the air in the uh, compressor room, we can use different types of uh, dryers. We can use adsorption, we can use refrigerant dryers, and those are the two absolute most popular dryers uh, available. So if if we use adsorptions uh, when we need the drier air down to minus 40 degrees Celsius dew point, uh, if we are using refrigerant dryers, uh, the the air is a little bit more, quite a bit more uh, wet, so down to minus three degrees. Um, sorry, uh, down to three degrees um, pressure uh, dew point. If we need at some applications, once again, we are not uh, um, making the uh, the air quality the best in the whole system. We want to have good quality all over, and on the hardest applications, we we want to have it cleanest. Cleanest, yes. So then we can use membrane membrane dryer in front of the application. We have we we can make the air quality better just for this one application or few applications that are using uh, that are needing um, drier air. And then uh, there is another machine, which is a uh, cycle motor se a separator. It's not really a dryer, but it's also helping us in flushing the, the water out of the, of the system. So adsorption dryers and membrane dryers are using uh, what, is, uh, what is called a regenerating air. Uh, it's uh, while one of the tanks is drying the air, the other one is regenerating. So that's why when we are using those types of dryers, uh, they are not the mm, cheapest to use because we have to use our air that we already pressurized for the machine to use it. Yes. So uh, so some some of the uh, some of the air is going uh, is getting let's say wasted for the for the operation of the of the machine so once again we we have to remember about it we don't want to use better air that is necessary but then again we don't want we definitely don't want to use air that is of worse quality that we that we need and once again going back to the uh, to the uh, photo that i was showing you uh, before we can use all of the systems, not only dryers, to properly get out at least some water of the uh, of their of, on all of the uh, um, components, and we we should absolutely use it. And then we have to um, put the the condensate into the oil separators. And to finish the uh, the presentation today, I, I want to leave you uh, with a little exercise. How much water can actually be in air? Because the air is not wet. Yes, we usually use air for drying. But then again, if we have air of 20 degrees Celsius and 100% humidity, it can contain around 17 grams for one cubic meter. Yeah? And then, if we want to compress the air from seven uh, cubic meters into one cubic meter, so we are making the pressure go higher from one bar to seven bar, then it acts like if we would squeeze a sponge. At one point, when we will squeeze the sponge, the sponge is if we are not squeezing it, it's not really that wet in touch. But then if we squeeze it, 
it becomes completely soaked and then the water flows out and that's exactly the same um thing that's happening with with the air so once again if we have 17 grams of water in the air and we uh, we are compressing air that is 50 percent humidity as let's say in uh, in the room around us then the complete amount of water in the air that we are compressing is 60 grams and if we compress it it can only hold 70 grams 17 sorry from the 60 grams that uh, that was in the air it can only contain 17 so 43 grams of water is going to flow out of just one meter of compressed air so in fact this is as we know uh, sometimes not not a lot <laughs> But uh, if we are talking about industrial systems, when the air is going all of the time with huge volumes and huge quantities, it's insanely important to uh, have the uh, drier capacity available to take the water out of the system. With the company that uh, had the 80% leakages in the in the system, we calculated that every minute 700 uh, sorry 473 milliliters of of water uh, was going inside of the installation and they had um, um, the dryer was damaged for a few days so imagine the flood that was happening inside of uh, inside of the uh, inside of the system i just passed one hour and uh, that's uh, the end of the presentation for today. Uh, to remind you, the next week we are we are going to talk uh, with with all the bases that we that that we have ready. We will talk about the optimization of the applications and finding the actual savings. So thank you very much for your uh, participation. And if you have any questions, please uh, ask them now. If we don't have uh, time for for answering, uh, then I can just prepare them, and I will uh, put them in to my presentation next week. So once again, thank you so much for uh, for listening. And uh, Alexandra, I'm giving the uh, microphone back to you. Thank you, Vita. Thank you, everyone, for participating at this uh, this webinar. As uh, my colleague told you, next week we will have the, the second session of this uh, topic. I hope that uh, you find it uh, interesting. And now uh, some colleague asked us if we can send him the, the presentation. Mm -hmm. Can we send? Uh, can we send the presentation? I would have to see if there are no materials that are, uh, let's say, uh, uh, fragile. <laughs> but I think that as I have all the sources of uh, of pictures that I used uh, in the presentation. So I, I think yes. I, th I think yes. There there shouldn't be a problem. In in any case, uh, they can use the the handout we have uh, here in the. Uh, interface of the go to webinar we have the the handout and it is uh, mostly what uh, my colleague presented you can download this for free and uh, after the my colleague check maybe we can send you also the the presentation so thanks again for participating at this uh, webinar it seems that there are no uh, no more questions. And for that, thank you again, V, and see you next week. Once again, thank you very much for inviting me uh, and hear you uh, next week. Take care. Ciao. Happy, happy Easter. Oh, exactly. Happy Easter to you too. <laughs> thank you. So, see you next time. Goodbye, everybody.